Amen. Well, please uh, be seated. Uh, I'm always saying I'm honored to uh, be Pastor Don's relief pitcher. Uh, if you know a little bit about baseball, <clears throat> the thing is, if you're the relief, relief pitcher, you never know when you're going to get the call at the bullpen to say, hey, it's your turn to come up. And so uh, yesterday, uh, Don uh, was due to be at my house for a newcomer's dinner, and and uh, he didn't answer my phone. And I thought, well, it must be something important. He's probably talking to Meredith or something like that, right? And uh, later I text him. I didn't get a response. And I thought, wow, that's very unusual for Don. And then I finally got a response, and he said, hey, I woke up with nausea. It hasn't been a good day. And finally, I think around 6.30 or so, he said, I'm still not feeling my best. So I think I'm calling you to fill in for me. And so here I am, right? And uh, so, yeah, be praying for me because uh, uh, I want to thank Don for doing all the, all the work in today's message. And all I have to do is present it. I think this is a, probably a good strategy from now on is if I have to preach, I see. You do all the research, you pray to the Lord, let him speak to you, and then I'll come and deliver it <laughs> with four hours of work. But uh, God is good nonetheless. And so uh, one of the good things about the culture here at Springdale is that, you know, we plan our series together. We talk about what are the different topics that maybe the Lord would want us to pray about, talk about, and deliver. And, and of course, it's, it's, an, it's an everyday evolving kind. You, you, we never know until it's finally done, Right. And so uh, on Fridays, we always get together as the staff and talk about the message and the illustrations, examples, and give input and so forth. So at least I felt like I kind of know what he was going to talk about and now uh, what God wants me to talk about. And so as you know, we've been doing this series for three weeks now on I Am Springdale. Springdale meaning the name of the church. We're the Springdale Church, uh, Springdale Baptist Church. But the phrase, I am Springdale, uh, it was at that staff meeting that, yes, I, I told Don, it's like the bottom line is we are the church, and we have to finally disconnect from the idea that, well, let's just get people to the church. Listen, I am the church. You are the church. And if all we do is bring people to the church building, it's going to take a long time before some people show up because they already have this perception about who the church is, and, and it's not pretty. But if we begin to believe that we are the church and start thinking like it and acting like it, we will begin to change their perception of who we are as a church. And long before they ever arrive here, the questions will arise about why do you do this and why do you say that? And so let me summarize for you where we've been the last three weeks. We started out by saying, okay, if I'm going to be Springdale outside these church walls, I have to learn how to listen to God. Now, why would we call it a personal relationship with God if we never personally relate to God? Isn't that kind of a contradiction? And so if I call it a personal relationship with God, it's because I personally connect with God. I actually have the privilege to hear him speak to me. Is that true for you? Because God has made it such that he's torn down the curtain wall, the the, the thing that kind of separated, you know, the, okay, this is the clergy and here's the lady, the laity. It's like God wants everybody to have access to him. And so if I'm not learning how to listen to his voice, I'm in trouble. Because I will never really discover the depth of his love for me. Oh, I understand it for, for Don and I understand it for so-and-so, but what about me? Well, it's available to you. And therefore, I have to learn how to spend time with him, how to be with him, how to cultivate my personal intimacy with him. And there are different ways to do that. And you can read God's word. You can hear God's word. You can meditate. You can spend time in silence. You can spend time in solitude by yourself. You can journal. You can fast. There are so many ways to connect with God. And if we just give him the freedom to say, okay, God, here I am. Speak to me. Then maybe, maybe we may actually just hear him speak to us. Why? Because we have turned off the radio, because we've turned off the TV, and so there's nothing to compete with. And God has our full and undivided attention. And so he begins to speak to us, and then we realize that we enjoy him. Then we realize that my motivations for him deepen, that my convictions for him get anchored and solidified 
You see, it's called listening to him. But listening to him is not enough. Also, I have to learn how to align with him. What we mean by there is realizing that because God calls me a son or a daughter of himself as the father, that he wants to give me a new identity where I begin to believe who he says I am despite my past, despite my titles at work, despite my uh, achievements that are on the wall, despite the education that I've achieved. God says, that's, that's not who you are. And I want to empower you to be who you really are as my disciple of Jesus. And this is so much bigger than filling your head with knowledge. This is so much more impacting than changing your moral behavior. This is about allowing my presence to actually fill your heart. And when he begins to fill your heart, then you begin to understand that if he can work in me, he can then work through me. Oh, that is so far different than just doing church. Oh, that is so far different than just going through the religious motions that it seems so many are already familiar with. And then what happens is, because I have this surrendered heart, God shapes my character. He begins to impact my attitude. He begins to pour down his attributes. He begins to shape my values. I change from the inside out. It is a work of God. It's not me. Doing anything is God being in me and changing me. But then we said last week, as Don shared, that we can't just listen to God. We can't just align our hearts to God. We've got to show up for the game and play the game. We've got to actually do something. Because as God is growing me and shaping me and maturing me, then the God-honoring behavior begins to flow out. What has been happening on the inside begins to now become a reality on the outside. And it is evident that something is going on. Because then people begin to see the demonstration of God's power in my life now made known. And so I don't debate God I don't question God. I simply submit and say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Here I am responding in obedience. And then people say, wow. It is obvious that you are a different person. You see, what I do now shows what God cares about. What I do now shows what God values. What I do now shows what God is passionate about. What I do is what God said be done. You see, God wasn't kidding when he said, seek first my kingdom and his righteousness, and they become mine. See, God wasn't kidding when he said, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He actually meant it that that one day when I pray, the very first thing I ask for is, God, all I know is this. I want your kingdom to become reality on this earth as it is already up there. And I want your will to become reality on earth as it is up there. That's what I'm asking to happen, Lord. And I take those and own them as mine as well. You see, God's will becomes mine, and God's priorities become evident. And when people see my actions, they see a mirror reflection of what Jesus looks like in this thing that he calls his kingdom, where he is the king, and I simply let him reign over me. So today, then, we land on the last L, lead others to God. I have a picture here I want you to take note of. Most of us have seen this perhaps at the park or maybe on the street. You see, I think a lot of times we forget that when we make that decision to follow Jesus, there is only one Jesus, and I'm not it. But as I follow the mother duck, I begin to quack like him. I begin to walk like him. I begin to look like him. And you see, it doesn't matter where you are in this process. If you're just getting started and you're at the very end or you're immediately right behind the Lord, what is important is that you know that you need him and you follow him. And somebody is somewhere down the road behind you. 
and you realize they need it just as much as I do, and maybe I'm a mile ahead. So if that's the only experience I have or a day ahead, then I use that day to influence them on what it looks like to follow this Jesus. And so I need to get equipped then to know how to do this. Not because I have fully arrived. We never fully arrived. You know what we've learned? All we've learned is how to be dependent on Jesus. All we've learned is how much I need Jesus. What makes me an expert is I'll be the first to raise my hand and say, like, I mess up all the time. <laughs> but if it weren't for the gospel, I'd really be in trouble. But because of the gospel of grace, God accepts me. God approves me. And he's still changing me. And so, you see, it's not about me. It's about who's at the head of the pack. And so, what do we do then? We begin to change, and guess what happens? Changed people change people. Broken people help heal broken people. That's us. I like what pastor and author Kyle Eidemann said. He said, I don't know of any person who doesn't want to make a difference in the world. Nobody grows up dreaming of waking up, going to work, heading home, watching Netflix, scrolling through social media, and then doing it all over again every, other, every, every day of the week until their last breath. We all want to be used to change the world. Do you want to change anything? Do you want to make a difference? What if you do, but something isn't happening? How did Jesus do it? One person at a time. One encounter at a time. One heart at a time. I think sometimes we kind of complicate things. And we forget it's really simple. It's about having a life of love. That's it. Sounds pretty simple. And also very deep. I like what Mother Teresa said. She said, there is power in small things done with great love. There is power in small things that are done with great love. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it in Galatians chapter 5 verse 6. He said, the only thing that counts, the only thing that counts is that I reach a savings account of $100,000. Eh, not exactly. The only thing that counts is I get at least a master's degree. The only thing that counts is I need to have at least 12 children. Right? What is it that really counts for you? This is what God's word says. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself how? Through love. See, everybody can say they have faith. That's not the question. The question is, so how does your faith show up? Is it through love? That's the question. Because God is on to something here. When he introduced Jesus with this new covenant, it was only about one thing. And it was always about this one thing, but we complicated it. And so he gets us on track and he says it's about one thing and it's called L-O-V-E. Love. Love is the true sign that you know Jesus. Oh, no, but you don't understand. I know the whole Bible and I can explain it. Love is the true sign that you know Jesus. The rule of life is love. That's the real rule of life. Love for God and for others is what reveals what's most important to us. What's important to us? Is it love relationships? Love is what Don said last week, the distinguishing characteristic mark of a true disciple of Jesus. Jesus says, uh, I'm going to give you a new rule. Love each other as I have loved you. That's it. 
Love is what proves that you have faith. Love is what pleases God. Love is what motivates my obedience. Love, catch this, is the only true measure of spiritual maturity. Love is. How do I measure my spiritual maturity? I hope it points to love. And the measure of my love is God's greatest expression of his, catch this, of his presence in my life. That's how you know that you know God. His presence shows up in this thing called love. And so love is a big deal. There's nothing that we can substitute for it. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you in John 20, 21. Now, we know he was talking to his disciples and, of course, in the Great Commission. We know that he wasn't just talking to the 12. He was talking to the disciples that would follow him for the rest of time until he comes back. You see, God is a sending God. I like what Rick Warren once said. It's not about your seeding capacity. It's about your sending capacity. Jesus was the best that God could send. And in the Bible, we discover this word sent 44 times in the New Testament. After Jesus resurrects, he passes his identity to his disciples and he says to them, follow me. You see, to follow Jesus is to understand that we're being sent. Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. I thought I had to just go up, go and show up at the church and see the game played out. No, apparently not. So if Jesus sends us as the Father sent him, we have to then position ourselves for a greater purpose than living for ourselves. Let, let me give you an example of this. I've been dialoguing with a friend here for the last three and a half weeks. See, I met this friend over 25 years ago when I was a regional risk manager for a company. And uh, he interviewed, among others, and he didn't exactly have all the qualifications of the other safety consultants. But I really liked his level of transparency. He really had a learning spirit. There was just something about him that I said, you know what? I could probably train this guy. I could probably mold and shape this guy to really be the best safety professional that this company has ever seen. And so when it was all said and done, I hired him. And for eight months, I discipled him on what it means to be a safety consultant. I taught him everything I knew. I mean, I poured into him. I mean, one time he had a problem with the manager, and really it wasn't his problem. It was the manager's problem. And I backed him up, and he said, you know what? You're the first manager that I really have because I'm straight out of college. But if this is what a real manager is, looks like, I'm glad you're my manager. And I said, well, I believe in doing things right. And it was not fair what they were doing to you. I was in Texas. He was up in Minnesota. And so a few weeks ago, he called me and said, hey, you know, we've been in touch all these years. And I'm fast forwarding here. You've, you've heard me say there was a guy once that I hired that I led to Jesus. I, dis I discipled him. I baptized him in a hotel pool. And we've stayed in contact all these years. And he calls me and he says, hey, Ray, uh, I have an opportunity to move up with the company for the fourth time. Except this time, it's to become the vice president. But I need your advice. Now, who would have ever thought that 25 years ago, I would hire this little kid from college who thought he was going to be an NFL quarterback, but he had a knee problem when they hurt him, and that was the end of his career, so now he's looking for a different career. Who would have ever knew that one day this young man would become a vice president of a company, not just in the career of safety, but also a disciple of Jesus. You see how this works? I mean, God already saw it coming. I didn't. 
And so over the years, we've maintained contact. He'll call me for prayer. He'll call me for advice. Hey, this promotion, okay, I'll pray for you. Uh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? See, I'm still discipling him, not just, I'm, I'm discipling him on how to do life. Not just how to know scripture, but wisdom. See, and he sees the value of God in his life. And so that's, that's what it should look like for all of us is that we have influence over people's lives because of who God is and what he's done in our lives. And so we position ourselves to leverage that influence. And so I was reading one of the um, statistics that Don uh, discovered from Lifeway, and it said three out of four people you meet need Christ. That's 75% of the people that you encounter need Jesus. And then in the survey, it said that 63% of the people who were asked if they were willing to receive information about Jesus, 63% said uh, only in a personal conversation with a family member. 56% said, yes, I would consider it if it was from a friend or a, na a close neighbor uh, from a church nearby. You know what this tells us? This tells us that programs don't lead people to Jesus. People lead people to Jesus. Are we Jesus people? Because that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 4, 19. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There are three things in the uh, discipleship journey that we talk about in his ways. And the first one is that, okay, we need to understand that if I say I'm going to follow Jesus, I am following a who, not a what. This is a person. This is a real person that I'm learning to pursue and follow. Secondly, that I understand, he says, I will make. In other words, the implication is that he's going to do something with me, that he's going to change me, and I have to be willing to be changed. That's a hard one to swallow. Because there's a whole lot of people going to church, but they never change. So are they really following Jesus? Not according to Jesus. I mean, he even said it himself. Hey, don't bother being my disciple if you're not willing to, right, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. But then he says the third thing, and I will make you what? I will make you fishers of men. Now, he's talking to the disciples, and one of them is Peter. And, of course, Peter sees not his first miracle. His first miracle is probably when his mother-in-law got healed. And now we have Jesus calling on the fish to one side of the boat. And all the boats are overflowing from the weight of the fish. And then it's when he, it hit him and he said, Jesus, you need to get away from me because I don't think you know me. I'm a sinner. And what was Jesus' response? I'm going to turn you into a fisher of men. Apparently, God has a game plan for us that is beyond maybe what we considered. And so Jesus is telling us, follow him, allow him to change us, allow him to give us a purpose in allowing others to also trust and follow him. So what keeps us from following through in leading others to Jesus? Let me give you a few reasons. Because the enemy knows God's game and he's going to try to thwart it. And the first one is, have you ever felt unqualified? Eh, I don't really know too much about the Bible. I mean, I don't even use the King James. Right? I mean, I have to use the simple version. It's a paraphrase. I don't even, I don't even think that counts. What qualifications did the woman at the well have? You remember the story? Uh, well, let's see here. She's had four failed marriages. She's living with a guy right now. Like, you don't look too good. I mean, her resume was all written up with failed relationships. And what does she do? She goes back into town, and what does she do? She tells everybody about this Jesus that knows all her life story. 
the good, the bad, and the ugly. What are her qualifications? Jesus. Jesus is who qualifies me to share him. You see, we can't do this on our own power, but Jesus says, but I'm going to put my power in you to be able to testify about me. So you're going to have to rely on my power to get this job done. How about busyness? You feel like you're too busy? Got a lot on your calendar? You know, there just doesn't seem to be enough time. I mean, you don't understand. I got to brush my teeth, right? I got to watch the news. That's at least an hour. I got to get dressed. I got to drive in some pretty congested traffic. I mean, I could show you my calendar. I just don't have time. Can I be honest with you? God is not asking us to add one more thing to our calendar. You know what he's asking? Hey, would you be willing to be me in your calendar? Could I accomplish my mission using you in your calendar? Don't add anything else to your calendar. Just wherever you go, be a Jesus apprentice. Whatever you say, say it like Jesus would say it. Whatever you do, do it like Jesus would do it. Just let Jesus enter your world on a moment-by-moment, day-by-day experience. How about fear? Fear of the unknown, fear of rejection. I mean, I remember the first class I took in evangelism. You know, you had to learn the, you know, like the four spiritual laws. Was it three or four? It was four. Okay, I was doubting myself already. Right? Right? And I'm like, you know, you do this, you do that. When you knock on the door, you know, and I was scared to death. It was like, I, I, I already envisioned my mind. Person opens the door, and he's got a shotgun. I can already see it happening, you know. I ain't going first. Let somebody else get to heaven earlier than I am, okay. I'll wait my turn. Fear. How do you do, how do you deal with fear? Fear is a feeling. We did a series once, do you remember? I think it was during the pandemic. Faith over fear. That's how you do it. You're going to have to let faith drive you, not fear. Now, you can still be scared. It can still be risky. But there's an adventurous nature to it because you've said, God, you're in control. I'm not in control. You take the lead. I'm just doing whatever you tell me to do and say whatever you ask me to say. You will even give me the words. I'm trusting you. Next thing you know is like, I think I can do this. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I think you can do this through me. You see? How about this one? Complacency, indifference. Or apathy. Those are big words. Just put it in neutral. Don't say nothing. Don't do nothing. Don't ask. Don't tell. You know, just play it safe. And you may not even care. I love this example from C.S. Lewis, the screw tape, screw tape letters. Anybody read that particular? Yeah, it's a good book. It has a senior ranking devil, screw tape who's briefing his apprentice nephew, Wormwood, on the subtleties and techniques of tempting people. The goal, he counsels, is not wickedness but indifference. Screwtape cautions his nephew to keep the prospect, the patient, comfortable at all costs. And then this definite, definitive job description, he says, I, the devil, will always see to it that there are bad people. Your job, my dear Wormwood, is to provide me with the people who simply do not care. Wow, that's a strategy if I've heard one. Yeah, don't, you don't have to make them wicked. Just make them complacent. Just make them full of apathy. Just make them indifferent. 
that gets the job, the job done just as well. And so we are in a spiritual war. It is really happening. But how about the last one? Do we have a last one on the, on the screen? Because I was trying to summarize Don's thoughts. And, of course, this is the best I could do. A mediocre Christian life. This is the one that the world is not happy about. You know, th this, is, this is the person like, well, I mean, you know, like I'm not ready because, I mean, after all, you know, I still got a lot of issues. Right? I mean, I still like to do this. I can't really say it out loud. I still like to do that. I keep that under the cover. You know, and so, so there's like this double life going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I go to church. I mean, you know, I do tithe sometimes, you know, but I believe in offerings. You know, and, and you know, I, I do, I, you know, I do believe in church, you know. And so I'm kind of, yes, sort of a Christian. But if you heard Don, Pastor Don's message last week, are we sure we're disciples? Because Jesus would say, why do you call me Lord, and yet you don't think like me, yet you don't look like me, yet you don't act like me. In fact, let's just call it what it is. You do not live like me. And Jesus made it pretty clear. I'm going to have to tell you, uh, away from me, evildoers, I don't know you. And he was talking about religious people. He was talking about Christian people. And so there has to be a genuine dimension to this following Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 reads, Paul pleads with us to strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back. Satan is a liar, and he's going to say, well, you can't possibly follow Jesus and still be happy. You're, it's just not doable. And so you've got to do a little bit of both, you know, so that way you cover both bases. There is nothing more self-fulfilling than saying to yourself, I did what Jesus asked me to do. I mean, can you imagine you get up to heaven, and everybody's looking for... Jerry Campbell. Where is Jerry Campbell? All I know is I want to find Jerry. I want to talk to Jerry Campbell. And everybody's like, well, who's Jerry Campbell? Like, you know, I don't, is, that a, is that a prophet? Uh, who is that guy? Jerry, I just want to thank you for leading me to Jesus. Hey, Jerry, I want to thank you because you led my cousin, but my cousin led me, so I want to thank you because you started it all. You see, the only thing that's going to matter when we get to heaven is that somebody is going to say, I am thankful that so-and-so led me to Jesus. Because otherwise, I wouldn't be here. And that's all that matters. I would rather be here than the other place. Because at the other place, they don't have air conditioning. <laughs> See, extraordinary people for God are simply ordinary people who are willing to say, yes, God, use me. No special qualifications required. John chapter 5, verse 19 reads, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. And so what we need to be asking is, God, where, what are you doing? Where are you at work? Who are you drawing to yourself? Give me discernment. To take note. You know, when, when Don shared the story about the Denny's, you know, it would have been nice if, if you know, if, if I had been the one that, you know, was the lead on that story. But it was my wife, and so I just submitted myself. <laughs> you know, it seems like she becomes the hero more than me. And uh, so I'll just give her support. But there was something about Nellie talking to them the way she did it, where they felt comfortable. They don't speak the language. They're trying to order up the menu. And she just interacted with them. I could hear the whole conversation because I didn't get up from my seat, you know, because I feel like, Lord, I think you want me to sit down because I don't want to draw a crowd. Right? <laughs> no, I didn't say that. But as I'm sitting there, I'm just saying, Lord, if, if you're up to something here, then just let it happen. 
We come back to sit down. We're eating our food. When we're ready to leave, the young man gets up and he says, ma'am, uh, excuse me, I am not trying to be disrespectful or anything, but could, could I give you a hug? I mean, I'm standing there like, hey, boy, like, no, this is my woman, okay? Like, <laughs> crossing the line here. Like, no, 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 no. It's, we're, you, she already told you, you know, she's a pastor's wife, so, I mean, don't take advantage, okay? Come on. I mean, I, what was I supposed to say? I just said, young man, no problem. She says, you know, she's like a, she's like a mom. And, you know, a lot of people talk to Nellie and they call her Mama Nellie. Because she has that, 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 that attitude that just nurtures people and they feel comfortable. They feel warmth and they feel like, I can talk to this person. But then he says, hey, would you pray for me? Do you see how this started? And that's when I put it in gear. Like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, we'll pray for you. Like, let me put on my robe, you know. And I said, oh, of course, you know, how can we pray? What's, what's going on? Mind you, we're in Denny's. We're in the middle of the floor, and there's people buying and, you know, ordering and all this. We just forgot about all that. And we prayed, like, right there in the middle of Denny's with everything else going on. It wasn't until afterwards I told them, like, oh, man, we're going to get kicked out of Denny's, you know, because, like, we're disturbing the peace. But, you see, that's, that's the whole point is we don't have to make nothing happen. We just have to open our eyes and see what is going on around us. Because sometimes we get so focused on our world and our purpose and what we want to accomplish and what we want to achieve. And we forget that God is doing something that he wants to use us in, but we're not receptive to his guidance. And that's why we wonder if God ever shows up. Well, he, he's there and ready, but we haven't said, okay, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Do what you're going to do. I'm I'm responsive. See, we're not talking about divisive gimmicks here. We're talking about just, just do life with God in it. Be real. Be transparent. Like people are tired of fake people. They're tired of the hypocrisy. That that turns them off. And so what do you do? You're honest. You share your struggles. You share your weaknesses. You show, you show them how God has made you strong despite that stuff. If you've been in prison, it's like, oh, you can't let that out of the hat. Start using it for Jesus. Okay? Start using it for Jesus. I remember a young man walked into the church. He was a brother of a young lady that was a member there. And he wanted to talk to me. And he said, hey, uh, you know, when I was in prison, you know, I found Jesus. And I want to get connected to a church. And I wanted to see how do I do that and so forth. And so I didn't feel uncomfortable saying, like, well, so uh, what, what were you in prison for? Because, you know, we need to make sure that this is the right kind of church for you. Like, no, no, that was the last thing on my mind. He said, well, you know, for New Year's, I was part of a gang, and I shot this pistol, and the bullet went up, and the bullet came down, and it hit a 10-year-old kid and killed him. And so I went to the penitentiary for 10 years of my life because of that dumb, stupid mistake and the people I was hanging around with. I was like, man, I'm so sorry to hear that. He said, oh, I'm not sorry. Because had I not gone to prison, I wouldn't have found Jesus. Ooh, wow, I wasn't expecting that one. So you see, it doesn't matter if you were the victim, if you were the victor, if you were. You know what really matters? How is God in on this one? That's what really matters. Because God will salvage any ugly story for his redemptive hand. And it will show him to be the true hero of your life. But you got to let people know. 
I was meeting with the pastor once. He said, like, oh, you know, nobody knows this, but, you know, I struggle with depression. I said, well, like, why do you keep that private? He's like, you know, I don't want to lose my job. I said, bro, like, depression is, is, a, is a medical condition that, are you on medication? Like, yeah, I got I to gotta take medication. But, but you know, it does, doesn't solve it completely. I said, do you know how many people in the church suffer with depression? And, and you know, you could identify with them and you could empathize with them. You could share that. In fact, remember, there might be somebody who's come to the church to visit. And because you sharing that, they come to Jesus. In fact, you don't have to wait to go to the church to share it. Just share it as you meet people and discover that, hey, you know, they're going through a hard time for whatever reason. You realize, hey, I went through that too. You are, you are a witness for good or for bad. There is no in between. Because if you're neutral, that's bad. And so you've got to develop relationships with people. You've got to ask the deep questions. Hey, how's life treating you? What keeps you up from sleeping at night? Right? What challenges are you facing right now? Right? And if you ask him, hey, how can I pray for you? He's like, well, you know, let's say it's financial. Has it ever occurred to you that sometimes the reason God had them tell you that it's financial is so that you would step in? Oh, well, you know what? Oh, I'm really sorry. To hear. You know, I'm going to call Pastor Don. Maybe the church can do something. Time out. Okay, aren't you the church? Aren't you part of the church? Like, is there any chance that God might be telling you to help from what you can help? Yes. They're not, they're not, they're not going to go to the church necessarily, but if they're your friend and you see the need and you're receptive to it and you feel with them and you hurt with them and say, hey, look, man, all I got on me right now is $25, but here, that's when people begin to see Jesus differently. That's when they begin to see that Jesus can and does make a difference because we are the living example. That's when people really get drawn to God because they see that maybe we are the closest thing to Jesus that they know. And guess what? You are. But you've got to activate it. You've got to use their transition, use their crisis as a bridge to help them, to speak truth for them, to encourage them, to support them, to pray for them, to be their real friend. I like what Bob Roberts said. I think Pastor Don used this quote. And it's worth repeating. Great worship services don't change the world. Empowered, impassioned disciples change the world. Do you agree with that? You change the world. How? Well, we've been talking about this whole series. Start listening to God. If you don't know how, start learning how. Ask somebody, hey, how can I, help me how to listen to God's voice. Start aligning your heart. Look, God doesn't want to do you to do anything for him before he works in you. He will meet you where you're at. Because he wants whatever hap is happening inside here to be an expression out here. He doesn't like people going through the motions. He'd rather have somebody do absolutely nothing but be fully surrendered to God and saying, God, I need you. Show me. Teach me. Fill me. Because I know one day I could probably be used by you, but right now I need some help. But then what if we've done the first two? Then start living it out. You don't need to know a whole lot about the Bible. You just need to understand that God loves you and God love works in and through you. I mean, isn't it coincidental that the Bible says there is no law against such things as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, like you can do amazing, dramatic, radical things if you start letting the Spirit produce that in your life as you interact with other people. Because instead of being impatient, you're patient with them. That's powerful. 
Because in, instead of retaliating and, and, and seeking revenge, no, you say, I'm going to forgive this person. And I'm going to reconcile. You see, that is supernatural. Only God can do that. But when you do it, people take note. This is not the way the world does life. This is the way Jesus does life in us and through us. As we close our service and we sing this last song, I know, I know the Lord has been speaking to us in different ways. And I really hope and pray that this series has, got, has caused you to rethink, how do you want to live the year 2023? Are you just going to continue with the same old, same old? Are you going to be Springdale? Are you going to say, God, I know, I know at least four things I can do this year. And the first two have nothing to do with action. They just have to do with being. I want to learn how to be with you on my own time, privately. I want to know, I want to know how to let you change me from the inside out. I want to learn how to do that. And then, Lord, I want to start showing it. It doesn't matter if I got it, I'm at the, at, right behind the, the mother duck. It just matters I'm in the line. I, I'm going in the right direction. I mean, I still stumble and I still veer off. But you know what? One thing is true. I'm still following the leader. And so I don't have to have a perfect record. I just have to show I am faithful to him even when I'm stumbling. He still forgive me even when I did it again because I did, it just makes me realize how much I need him and I seek him and I say, Lord, just develop me even if it takes a hundred times. I'm still here saying, God, change me. I don't want this because this is not who I am. You don't take my behavior and say, that is who you are. No, you see me as the son or daughter of the living father, the author of life, to whom one day we will respond. As we sing then, let God speak to your own heart. Whatever it is that you need to make right with him, I'd say, make your decision. Make your decision by faith and then start exercising your faith in such a way that God says, uh-huh, I see what's going on here. My love is at work here. And that pleases me. Let's stand as we sing.